Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are doing a little bit of a different time for the stream today. The main reason for that would be I've got some homework that I need to do. There's also going to be a little more casting done with uh, Nick the Peasant. I don't know if you got to see the game that we did earlier today, but we hope to do at least one more. So I thought what would be a little bit better this time around would be if I tried some Crusader Kings now. That would free me up to do my homework. Sounds a little quiet. I've just got to work on my audio for a second. But yeah, so the plan here was I would be doing some... Oh, wow, that's really low. This should be better. <clears throat> uh, just going to be testing the level a little bit. And that's uh, kind of quiet. All right, let's see. Okay. I always have these... Uh, oddities at the start, but it's kind of nice because there tends not to be that much population in chat, at the start at least. So the plan here is basically uh, we're doing a cast with Nick the Peasant earlier today. We may do a little one a little bit later, and then I've got some homework to do. So I couldn't necessarily guarantee a time for streaming, which would make sure that I get everything that I need to do done, as well as uh, get a stream done. Now, right now, Saturday or Sunday is a bit of an optional stream day for me, but with Nick the Peasant, I wanted to make sure that we could uh, at least get a little bit of Crusader Kings into today. So uh, it'll be probably a bit of a shorter stream. I'll try and run it as long as I can. And uh, obviously, my apologies to those of you who are watching this as a VOD because you didn't get a chance to see the live uh, broadcast. I'm just trying out a couple of things as far as times that work and um, just things that will also work for my schedule as well. So... With that in mind, the one thing that I do do for every game, and I think I'm going to keep doing, especially because I'm looking for sort of ideal schedule times, is to talk a little bit about where the game is. Obviously, this chronicle gets a little bit longer and longer, but I'm sure it would be an interesting exercise for somebody to go back through the VODs and uh, see how my account of the, the House of Rose changes each time around. So yesterday we had... A lot of people come in, actually. That was really nice. Um, we talked a bit about the mechanics of the game and some of the features. So one of the things somebody asked how Iron Man works, you just click this gauntlet uh, here. But one thing that particularly interests me about this screen is, uh, which you'll, this is the custom game screen. You can use it to start a new game. In this case, it's just showing me the state of the world in my existing game. I can't actually pick other kingdoms because it's an Iron Man mode. So it'd be kind of dumb if you play something like Iron Man mode and then all of a sudden decide, oh, you know, I'm going to play the, you know, some caliphate down here that's conquering everything. Uh, but thing, one thing that does, I suppose, interest me is that this, when you start, is at around the 70% level. And then I believe through playing, we actually got to the 76% mark. So the game became harder. Uh, and now we've fallen to 49%, so I basically through going through about three or four generations of this family, I'll, I'll go through the family tree and see how it went, how many, which uh, generation we're on. Uh, we've now made the game easier for ourselves. The goal of this particular playthrough is going to be going from a count to king. Uh, we have become a count, or sorry, we have become a duke, um, and the question now is the best way to actually become a king. Uh, ideally, I'd of course like to be the Empire of Britannia, but that's well in the future. So we started off in Westmoreland. Uh, we were conquered by the Vikings, as is pretty much inevitable in that particular situation. Uh, but we quick within the the first generation, we did actually declare our independence and were able to maintain it. This was just a matter of waiting for the opportunity when the um, Basically, when Jorvik was particularly weak, when they'd taken a bad fight, we declared our independence and we were able to, to fight for it. Now, the reason why we surrendered our independence was uh, the what was at the time uh, the petty kingdom of Wessex actually succeeded in taking Lancaster. And so, with at the time they had about 4,000 troops. Uh, we had a little under 1,000, and I didn't necessarily want to go and fight against a kingdom which had access to 4,000 troops. So what we did was we became a vassal of the Kingdom of Wessex. Now the, uh, originally the, or sorry, it was originally Wessex, then it became the Petty Kingdom of Mercia, and then it became the Kingdom of England. 
we took over Lancaster and uh, basically through the petty kingdom of Mercia becoming the kingdom of England, we were given Chester and we were given the title of the uh, Duke of, what is it? Duchy of Lancaster. So um, in this case here, it was something that paid off for us. Basically, uh, the main reason for becoming a vassal would be because it's a dispute between two vassals. And so the king doesn't necessarily need to get involved. Whereas if I'm an outside force coming to conquer, then I am going to have to deal with his army. So we can quickly run through our kings. And I believe he was not playable. So which of the... Yeah. I believe we played Eadbald was the first character. I think it went Eadbald, Eildwine, Let me just double check this. So I think Aethwald was the uh, the father of the guy who I started playing with. So I don't believe I played this guy. Uh, Eadbald, I believe, was the first uh, kind of the granddad that everybody remembers so fondly in this game. Um, in this case, he he was the one to... Oh no, I was wrong because it was the son that wound up being gay. So, so it was Aethwald. So in this case, this is now Great Granddad. This is the the scion who uh, impressed everybody. So he's the one who was able to assert his independence from the Viking kingdoms. He had his son, uh, Eidbald, which we were extremely concerned about because he was homosexual and had not produced an, a legitimate heir. But as you can see, did his duty for his family and died at the ripe old age of 54. We just finished a playthrough with uh, Eildwine, who lived to 59 and again had a little bit of difficulty getting a legitimate male heir, male heir, but it turned out and we were utterly panicking about Eidbald, who is on his third wife and just could not seem to get a kid. But once he finally married what was just one bar up from a commoner uh, finally produced something that we can work with. So we have another generation to keep playing with. And the strategic situation I find myself in is a bit of an interesting one. The original plan was to go inside of England and then eventually just seize it from the king. Now, the king is always going to have a pretty substantial army. I'm not going to be able to deal with uh, 10,000 troops. My demand is definitely not going to be big enough and I don't have much uh, in the way of vassals. Now, this will be fixed when I start having some kids and I hand them some duchies, but overall, uh, I'm not going to have a very successful revolution against this king. So I got a couple things that I've uh, got in mind. The strategy that I want to consider first is seeing how much of Wales I can take over, because if I can sex successfully take over Wales, then I can become the king of Wales. So number one, I've achieved my goal of becoming a king, and number two, uh, I have a larger power base for myself, which does not immediately go into the pocket of the King of England. The other thing that I'm considering is just to start expanding my holdings by going into, you know, this Viking territory, uh, finally take over Cumberland, which I've had my eye on for a while. Uh, the challenge with this one is it still doesn't necessarily deal with the fact that the King of England is extremely strong right now. Uh, and if I want to be taking that title from him, I need to make sure I have everything uh, in line. So we will, I think, what we'll do for a goal for the stream today is to get through uh, Eidbald's, like at least go through his life, and if it's a particularly short one, we'll maybe do a little bit more. Uh, but maybe we'll call it when we finish when we finish his story. Uh, we've had a little bit of trouble with the streams where I want to play through at least one generation, but usually something happens that makes it either an overly long playthrough or a particularly short one. So we'll see whether or not that happens this time around. Another thing to mention, just for anybody who's new, is I've had... It's not even like any rule that I read in a wiki or something like that, but I've always tried to have 300 gold as a reserve just in case there's some kind of an invasion that happens. My military right now is not that strong. Uh, 1,500 troops, maximum of 2269, which is better than what I had before, but still not, still not what I'm really looking for. 
Uh, what is this? Oh, it's because uh, I'd be a truce breaker. Or is it? Sorry, I'm talking to myself here. I just want to double check. Yes, I have signed a truce with... Uh... So actually, there was also a mistake uh, last game where I had originally intended to take uh, one of the counties in Wales, but I actually wound up taking Shrewsbury instead. So that was a bit of an oversight on my part, which has wound up costing me as far as a strategic position is concerned. But again, this game is mostly going to be about trying to take as much of Wales as I can. Uh, and if I fail to do that, uh, then I'll maybe consider expanding my holdings into Jorvik. Oh, and I'm sorry, I was talking about sort of the little algorithm I worked out for myself. So I want to hang on to about 300 gold, and this is mostly just so I can... Uh, it's mostly so I can have enough to... Um, how do I put this? It's so I can have enough to uh, hire and maintain a mercenary army in case a war doesn't go my way, or alternatively, I get a surprise invasion. That's really the best I can I can say about it. So I sit on an abnormally large amount of gold, but that's mostly just so I can I can have the safety. It is an Iron Man mode game, so you don't want to make a decision that sort of destroys your kingdom. Okay, so this kind of sucks uh, that I've been hanging on to this uh, prisoner, and the reason for this is that I really want to have my bishops like me uh, so I can ensure that stream of money. Now, I guess they don't, none of them really like me enough, and they all really like the Pope, so I don't need to worry so much this time around. But uh, this is a bit of a concern. I'm keeping him in my prison just so I can strip him of his title once I have somebody who can, uh, in basically somebody from my bloodline that I can give the title to. But uh, I'm not making that tithe money, so it's not going to change my overall finances yet. And unfortunately, the King of England got rid of free investiture, so I also don't get to put friendly faces in my, in my bishoprics. <laughs> Eadbald Rose is now known as the Fat. I believe he is glad. To yeah. <laughs> This is one of the problems we had with um, producing heirs, is there were no, you know, prime-aged, uh, well, I guess prime is a little bit of a different term, but basically, the best I could get was gluttonous. There were no lustful candidates for wives, so a bit of a concern as far as succession, but we got through it. couple comments as far as the game is concerned because this is the first time I've actually played from account to do actually that's not entirely true so the sharp eyed amongst you will have noticed that I didn't get an achievement for becoming a duke so I did do uh, one round which I haven't really followed that up on that much uh, where I did play as a, a count but I didn't like I haven't done that much in that particular game so this is kind of the first serious playthrough that I've done as far as um, you know, as far as playing a uh, playing my way up to king, I know some people recommend that you start this game as a relatively small nation. I think that makes a lot of sense. I've definitely learned, having been an independent nation and having been a vassal, there's a lot of stuff that you don't need to worry about as a vassal which is kind of interesting. And one of the main features of this game that I like is how you have to manage your relationships with people to see whether or not you can survive into the next, uh, the next age. Um, I should also maybe consider improving my reputation with the king, but this guy is getting on in years, so I think I'll maybe just wait for the next generation. I'm just putting a claim on Cumberland. It's mostly just because they are at full force right now, but if there's a time where they maybe go to war with somebody, it'd be nice to be able to take advantage of that and just add a little bit of territory. I suppose one nice thing is that I can always just dump some titles off on my son. Uh, okay, so we've got a new Pope. Let's just see how the relations go. So still not an ideal situation for me. I've still got some people who definitely like the Pope more than me and it's going to be really hard. I mean, 80 isn't the end of the world, but 
Bishop Edward is almost certainly never going to be paying me tithes just because he likes the, the Pope so much. And it looks like this war is over, so I'm waiting to be able to go on a pilgrimage. This so is not a commander, but... I mean, I know I'm not a command. Sorry, I know I'm not a commander, and yet it's saying that that's the condition that doesn't allow me to... to go. Still not quite sure how to deal with this plot. I mean, so far it hasn't been that big of a threat to me. But I do need to keep on top of it, because this is definitely something that's attempting to end my life when I have a particularly young heir. And I don't really have any way of obligating that uh, that individual. They are Scottish. So they basically just want to inherit my lands. I do the same thing, but I just need to make sure that I don't let that happen to me. What else can we talk about? Um, I'm still really curious why I'm not permitted to go on a pilgrimage. I think I'll just do something silly, raise my levies and bring them back down. Okay, that castle infrastructure message is a big one, so we'll just close off the menus as far as information is concerned. This will actually give me a chance to really use my levies. So the usual strategy that I employ here is to move these troops into the territory. And then once they land, actually i got to make sure that the larger force arrives first. So March 27th, yep, April 1st is fine. And then now that my main force is in the area, I can raise the last levy and just tilt things in my favor. It's basically just a way to try and keep the casualties down. And looks like we got a prisoner, which is a nice, nice touch. And now I can afford to go on a pilgrimage. I don't know if I just needed to reset something as far as my commander status or it was anticipating the Viking attack, but uh, I usually like to try and go on a pilgrimage nice and early so I can reap the benefits of the... Oh, sorry. Freighter 5. My picture is the Smiler. Uh, it is from Transmetropolitan. Not a lot of people recognize that, so good on you for recognizing the comic. Uh, there are a number of different holy places that you could visit on your pilgrimage. All of them are considered most sacred by the Holy Church, but somewhat, uh, a somewhat closer destination might mean a safer journey. Uh, this family has always gone to Santiago. It'd be kind of nice to go to one of the main uh, holy sites, but in this case here, he's got a young kid, which is the only individual in the line of succession, so safety first. We'll go to a holy site in the West. I really go far. Sorry, I just hit the button. <laughs> um, I'll go far next time. Let's say, uh, pilgrimage in the West is just as worthy to a, uh, is just as worthy of a journey to. <laughs> this is what I get for casting early in the morning. Well, not early in the morning, but uh, I did a cast with Nick the Peasant earlier. So, a pilgrimage in the West is just as worthy as a journey to Jerusalem or Rome, and I will visit the tomb of Saint James in Santiago. My things are packed, everything is in order, I am ready to walk the way of St. James. My journey begins. Yeah, I always see the one thing I like to do is once I become like a major title, so when I become the king, uh, my usual intention is to have the first pilgrimage I go on to, to go to Rome, because at this point you're a mover and a shaker and you, you go to show off. Uh, I'm not entirely sure becoming a duke is quite enough to justify the... Uh, you know, the fancy trip. But 
we can change it up. Anyways. Uh, dear husband, blessings on your house. I've been appointed as your regent. Let's hope my wife does a good job. All right, and my safety trip says... <laughs> They said this is a lawless stretch of road, but you still feel rather unlucky to be in this situation. The robbers are many and armed, and they demand that you pay a toll before you're allowed to pass. I pay ten gold. Uh, you stop to make camp near a river crossing with other pilgrims. You observe a group of builders working on a new bridge just upstream. You walk up to them and see that the arches of the bridge are already half completed. The master builder notice your in notices your interests and walks up and offers to tell you about the construction techniques they are using. You can say, yes, tell me more of this for a 30% chance at one learning. And nobles build castles. This is for peasants, and I can gain the trait proud. Now, you don't go on a pilgrimage to become proud. Let's learn stuff. And just my marshal telling me that my troops have increased. And uh, this, there was one important thing that happened, I kind of got a little sidetracked, was we did finally have the technology of castle infrastructure go down to Lancaster, so I can build my castle town right away. And I, this is the nice thing of having the surplus that you're building is I was already well above what I needed for the, uh, to keep my 300. I do also have a few more territories, so uh, in this case I can also build another castle town here, but I am going to wait until I've got about 600 gold, just a little less, before I build into that. Santiago. You have finally arrived at Santiago, the oldest major pilgrimage site in the west. It is an inland town close to the Atlantic Ocean, with origins going back at least to the Roman Empire. The fabled way of St. James is a long road to travel, and you have passed through many towns and villages on your way here. The legend holds that as St. James' remains were brought here by ship from Jerusalem, they were lost at sea due to a storm, but soon they were miraculously washed ashore, covered in scallops. Because of this, scallop shells have become a popular souvenir among pilgrims. Your mind dwells on the legends of this holy place as you make your way through the crowds towards the center of town. Hey, uh, is it... Aquil or Aqui? I've got, uh, I can't quite see the uh, chat properly from my angle here, but thank you for stopping by. Hope you enjoy Cru Crusader Kings too. I must remember to bring a seashell home with me. The saints, this holy ground, how it moves my soul. I realize now that my life up to this point has only been a preparation for this journey. How wondrous the light of the Lord only, sh uh, sorry, truly shines in me, a poor sinner. From now on, I shall always do his work. Praise the Lord. And I don't believe we have had a, ah, thank you. Um, I don't believe we've actually had a member of this family not turn out to be zealous. Ah, key. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's see, actually. So I know you can lose the zealous trait, but... Yep. Eild, Eildwine was zealous. Oh, Eidbald was cruel. I know for a fact he was zealous at one point, though. And Eilfwald, great granddad that everybody talks about in chat, uh, did start off with zealous. And I believe it was only last generation that was did not have more piety than the Pope. So this is one holy family. Uh, you finally returned from your pilgrimage. It was rewarding and interesting journey. You'd still do it. You, sorry, it was a rewarding and interesting journey, and you'd do it all again if you could. Still, it's good to be back home. Gain thirty piety and gain the pilgrim trait. Now, I do want to keep an eye on the... Uh, oh, actually, they've already got a new generation, so we will take this chance. Am I new to CK2? Uh, relatively new, yes. Uh, one of the things I was thinking of uh, here was just keeping an eye on the on this particular county because I was waiting for the treaty with the Carl of... I'm not even going to try pronouncing that. Um, but basically to wait for that generation to die out so I could declare war again. Now the difficulty with Holy War is that there will always be some friends that come in and Jorvik is kind of the scary fellow. But I do have a fairly strong king to back me up. I think what I'll maybe do here is just wait until my levies go up and then I can consider trying to take some territory again. This guy's fairly young, so I don't need to worry about him dying out. 
Well, I always appreciate comments in chat. Um, this is a little bit of an effort to do some, uh, you know, to do kind of a playthrough on my own uh, through it. But sure, if you ever, I always welcome advice. Uh, the only thing that I would ask is I remember when I did uh, Democracy 3, it sort of turned to a point where uh, people were sort of treating the stream as a bit of a voice activated or text activated controller. So um, the difficulty with that is I don't do that kind of stream very well. And I think people wind up disappointed. But uh, if you ever have some advice that you want to give in, just feel free to, uh, to send a message for sure. And hey, I smell like poo. How's it going? Glad to see you come, come in at the uh, uncommon hour for the stream. Firefly will not be giving advice, but will be giving suggestions that will probably get me killed. That's fine. I I usually wind up stopping myself. Catch you later going to watch the game. All right. Thanks for stopping by, Aki. Or Aki. Uh, sorry you disappeared yesterday. Kind of lost track of time. Fell asleep while working on stuff. That's fine. Again, I, it's always nice to have people stop by the, uh, the channel. It's always nice to have people participating in chat. But I am certainly not the only Crusader Kings channel on uh, Twitch. And there are other things that are happening so no need to apologize at all we always appreciate you when you're here and we may miss you when you're gone but certainly not to a point where you should ever feel feel sorry for that a rather heated discussion between myself and the stable master caught princess valentina's attention after listening uh sorry and after listening to us both she settled the matter between me and the stable master in a fair way i got the horse the stable master got the coin good Actually, on your point as well, I um, one of the reasons why I'm doing an earlier stream today is just to make sure that I have enough time for things like homework, and I'll probably be doing another Dota 2 cast with Present tonight, so this sort of seemed like the best opportunity to try and wrap up this uh, this generation of the House of Rose. That's right, you mentioned that yesterday. It's This is the dream to be on the big screen in somebody's house. A rather nettlesome neighbor keeps sending envoys begging for money or demanding tribute. I feel rather confused about his arbitrary ways, and I'm not sure what I should do. I could send him roses, or I could s nail the envoys' hats to their head. This is always a tough one for me, because I like prestige, but piety also counts towards the score. I always go for roses, and I'm going to do it this time around. So, gain 20 piety. Although I am wroth, so I suppose it's a little out of character to send somebody roses when they're annoying you. All right, so Constantine's no longer my steward. I think that's just a uh, relationship matter rather than anything else, but I think he had a nine, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he died, but anyways, this is a slightly better steward than what we used to have. Although the talent pool for the, uh, for the, I don't even know what this count, I don't know if it's a council or, yeah, it's council, not a cabinet. The talent pool for the council is pretty brutal. And looks like I have enough, I'm really hesitant to actually go go to war just because Jorvik does actually have enough to deal with me, but from a purely meta game perspective, it's way easier to get prestige than it is to get piety. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I mean, in the end, I'm not, other than, you know, some mechanics like holding a tournament and things like that, I can see why you would want a certain level of prestige, but it seems to me that all the stuff that has a prestige prerequisite tends to be fairly accessible like it's not that hard to get enough there my spy master still hates me oh that's right i completely forgot and you know it's actually a new spy master too i believe that is my wife who's now the spy master so my stepmom hated me 
and my wife hates me. <laughs> so stacking on these bad decisions, let's go to war. <laughs> The biggest thing I'm looking for is to see whether or not Jorvik comes to their aid. If they do, then I'm in deep trouble. If they stand by idly like last time, then I'm laughing. Okay, so Jorvik did agree to come in, but they haven't actually committed troops yet. And I am going to consolidate my troops before they do, so I should be in a good spot. This is the best decision! <laughs> I thought so. Ah, they're running away. Uh, the constant surges of adrenaline and increased heart rate makes me weary. It's not as fun being angry as it used to be. I should take it easier loses the trait wrath. So, apparently deciding to go to war was enough to just make my ruler calm the hell down. Now, I could just start with a siege already, but I do have my vassal levies up. I really want to take advantage of them as meat shields. So I'll just wait till I completely wipe out the, uh, the enemy, and then I'll keep my vassal levies in reserve. So it's kind of nice. It looks like Jorvik is doing the same thing that they did last time, which was give every support short of help. So as long as I can, you know, I'm not going to push the uh, speed up any higher than three just because I really do want to keep an eye on whether or not there's any troop movement along there. But I should be able to just take this county uncontested. There's two other kingdoms that are, yeah, Denmark is going to take way too long to get over here. So it's really just Jorvik I need to keep an eye on. And it actually looks like my wife has joined the plot to uh, kill me, so. Let's tell her to calm the hell down. Dear husband, may you live in harmony and contentment. I accept your demand. I will no longer back Katrina's dubious plan to kill you. Something about having your spy master on a plot to kill you that makes it kind of hard to sleep at night. You should throw some money or a horse or something. <laughs> I'll wait till one of the feasts during the dancing and then I'll throw some money at her. It'll be like a hip-hop video in the 900s. Right, so more bishops like me, but don't like me enough to give me money. Uh, Mercy cried the thief when Princess Valentina confronted her and accused him of being a robber. I could say, he's just a petty thief, at which point my wife will hate me even more, or throw him into the deepest dungeon and let him rot. Uh, this option is available because I have the just trait, and she'll react to the thief's punishment. So yeah, I'll throw him into the deepest dungeon. Prince Valentina thinks that I was just and gave the thief a suitable punishment. So I believe my spy master no longer hates me. Oh wait, Princess Valentina is different. But anyways, my wife doesn't hate me, so... So this is Den actually I keep forgetting that this is actually Denmark's holding. Uh, so they are actually raising troops, but I have nothing to fear from 110 troops. And I do have my castle town in Lancaster, so the next priority here is going to be building a ca castle town in Chester. Although I am also going to need to sort out what I want to do as far as distributing titles are concerned, because I'm going to exceed my demand size when I jump in. I'm not crazy about the fact that there's also Vikings here. What I'll probably do is, as I normally do, wait till the siege is done and then deal with them. But we'll see. We'll see how fast the the uh, 
values drop. This is usually what you have a king for, is to deal with this nonsense. Holy crap, that's a lot of them. Uh, the father was very upset, and I had to promise him I would look into the matter. His daughter had supposedly been, uh, supposedly been raped by a marshal, Mayor Gamal, and the father demanded the marshal's head on a plate. So, I believe he's not that adept at military matters. Well, he's 12, so. Uh, I can fine him for his crime, which means I get 20 gold, chance I become arbitrary, and the peasants are upset. I can imprison him, and I will gain the uh, just trait, which I already have, or I could say, I don't believe this, the daughter must be lying. Uh, at which point I... What? I gain the trait kind from that. It's pretty odd. So um, in this case here, it's not the best, but I really don't want a revolution when the uh, when I'm at war. So I will imprison my marshal. And then the easy way around this is just to get him to pay his way out. And apparently that counts as justice. So now that it's out, again, I can do a merit-based... Um, I could do a merit-based allocation of the job. Now, there is another guy who's got 12. It might be a wise idea just because he has a low opinion of me, but I'll put the mayor of Preston back in the job anyway, uh, because I'd kind of like to convert that. I'd like to convert the heathen before I put him in charge of my troops. And here I'm just going to chase down some of the uh, uh, the Danish troops. Mostly just to bump my war score up. I'm kind of in a bit of a holding point where I've already taken over one holding in this county. So it's nice just to get those little extra bits of war score when you can. And more importantly, it just prevents them... Like, one of the nice things about this game is you can actually take on a... Um, you can take on a significantly larger force just so long as you have... Oh, this is interesting. So Jorvik has mustered troops, but they've only done it because the king declared war on them. I think he's trying to take Northumbria. Which could... It'd be nice if he picked something else because this is relatively close to my area. It would have been a nice holding to have for myself, but... I'm not going to complain about the king... Uh, hurting Jorvik, because that's just another conquest I can go on. Watching sieges like this remind me about the uh, some of the old. I think this is about World War One battles, where somebody said that it was you know extended periods of boredom punctuated with moments of sheer terror. I suspect that's a little bit like what this siege was like. Anyways, we have expanded our realm. We've got a war going on with uh, Jorvik, which I don't want to participate in, so I'll just shut that down and think what my next move is. So this kind of gives me my toehold into Wales. Uh, I think I can set up the de jure kingdoms. Oh, that's nice, actually. So my son does own that. That's good to know. So it turns out it wasn't actually that bad for me to take this territory anyway. And the nice part here is there is actually a um, 
a heathen holding here as well. So the plan here was to get a toehold in Wales so that as I slowly sort of take over this area, I can become the king of Wales myself. I can get a third territory basically for free by declaring a holy war. Uh, the thing that I really want to do right now, though, is get another son so I can, you know, pass it on to him. Uh, I think there are other family members that could possibly count. Actually, they're all women, so... Uh, I believe Margaret had a matrilineal marriage, so I could probably give it give a title. Yeah, I could give a title to Thorid. Uh, but again, it'd be nice to kind of keep it in this branch of the family if I could. Uh, but the idea here is, I think uh, Gwynedd is going to be the best option as far as an attack is concerned. They actually, I'm a little surprised that they have a thousand troops, but generally, like they have just one uh, province or county which I can sort of take on my own. Uh, the bigger concern is Powys, in this case, well, actually apparently not, because they only have about 2,000 troops themselves. Uh, I would have thought they'd have something more just based on their, uh, on the size. Um, but I suppose a nice thing is, unlike Europa Universalis, you can actually march troops over foreign territory. And so in this case here, taking the uh, Duchy of Cornwall won't be that hard. And I can't remember how much you need to actually uh, create a title. So let me just see. I think you can find that by searching for titles. So to create the Kingdom of Wales, I would need 51% of the Dujir County, so I need six provinces. Yeah, thank you, Fred Five. Uh, I was actually mostly looking for the number of counties that are in there, but... Uh, there we go, we've got one, two... So out of the stuff that we can get for free, we've got three now. Um, it shouldn't be that hard to take this, so there's four. So what I could theoretically do too is just take these four areas and then move into Devon and Cornwall, and that would give me enough to declare myself King of Wales as well. Um, I think there is something to be said for going for something a little bit closer, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, right now I'm a little bit more worried about uh, passing out those titles to people who are in the House of Rose, so it's not a bad idea to just kind of hold back. Oh, shoot, I'm sitting on a bigger demand than I needed, so... I meant to give that, uh... I meant to give that county to my son. So I've kind of maxed out his demand size already by giving him the two. Uh, apparently I can't give him that title? That doesn't make sense. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll just take a look and see what my sister... So not ideal, but I don't necessarily want to go for the penalties of having too big of a demand, so I think... Um, actually, this is a good question. Do I want to give him... Yeah, this is the better one. So now our prestige is up to 62. I've definitely got plenty of space for vassals. I uh, I am going to be improving the centralization, so that number is going to get smaller than than what I have right now. Um, but my bigger concern right now is just making sure I have enough family members to give those titles to. Uh, with great martial ability, I've rounded up and executed robber bands that were plaguing Chester. Good for him. I didn't even know there were robber bands. Apparently, given the fact I did not know about the robber bands in Chester, this could mean I am one of those kings that just sits in the castle, castle and eats haunches of meat without, um, without necessarily caring about the well-being of his subjects. 
And I think given the comments I have made during these streams, you probably have the same estimation of me as well. If you do, may I congratulate you on your fine insight. A letter arrived from my Nettleson neighbor not many days after I had astonished after the astonished envoys returned home. He was most grateful and deeply touched by the red roses I sent him. Told you so, gain twenty piety, or they finally came to good use. The apple of Duke Ebalt I still don't know what that means, but Piety Maybe when I'm not doing an Iron Man game, I'll try some of those alternative options to see what they do. So we got more expanding technology. Unfortunately, we don't have much as far as uh, improvements are concerned, and I'm still not entirely sure why I'm not allowed to invite the Jews back, because it's definitely been a really long time since they were expelled. But I have a feeling it has something to do with uh, having my independence when they were expelled and being a member of the King of uh, Kingdom of England when they uh, when I would have normally had the option to return. So... It's going to be a pretty heavy hit to my technology, but it's just something that I, I factor in. That's why I don't have a lot of advisors going and, you know, doing this research, just because in the end they're going to be spinning their wheels for a few months and I wind up losing it to a random event. Digging straight down, I see that you just hit uh, follow. Thank you very much. I don't think I've seen you uh, speak in chat, but I really appreciate you hitting that follow button. And, I mean, for the rest of you, I know there were a few people who I had missed uh, last stream, so... The number of followers has actually grown pretty quickly the last month or so, which is extremely encouraging. A man claiming to be a lord who disappeared seven years ago has found his way to my castle. He sings of the fair queen Elfand and says uh, some of his songs are prophetic. Uh, long lost, but home again. I uh, gained the train kind, or he's finally found his way home then. And a courtier appears at the court. I think I already have the kind. No, I don't have the kind trait. So it'd be nice to get this uh, trait for sure. It does hurt my intrigue, and I do have somebody who's plotting to kill me. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is actually go for he's finally found his way home then, and the reason for that is just to deal with the fact that I don't have a lot of good candidates for counselors. Oh, my wife wants to kill me again. Please stop. Yep. Duke Eadbald the Fat. What a name. <laughs> I haven't even had a single member of this family be called the Great yet. Right, I was trying to go to my court and see. Oh, you know what? This is too troublesome to try and sort out the traits. Let's just see what I can do to my council. So, I've got bad choices for Chancellor. I have mediocre choices for Marshall. Got a pretty good steward. Do I have a... I finally have a spy master who one, doesn't hate me, and two, is actually good at their job. And I've actually got a pretty outstanding court chaplain, so... Uh, could be... Could be a better council, but definitely some improvement. I think here, just for safety, it's better for me to have a schemer in my capital. Actually, I think this is my capital. <laughs> Dear husband, your wisdom and mercy are legendary. I accept your demand. I will no longer back Christina's dubious plot to kill Duke Eadbald the Fat. And in case you forgot, <laughs> that's me. So please don't send me a letter asking why you're no longer my spy master. Oh, 
I actually haven't hosted any feasts yet, so I think your idea of throwing money at her is a fairly good idea. I, again, I, I just insist that it be done in slow motion, that we throw gold coins at her while she dances at a feast to be a ye old hip-hop video. Tumble wenches, gain ducats. I do try to read out the messages that come through, but usually when it's stuff like uh, the training, I... Uh, I mean, apparently I've, I've read the assassination letter from my wife like six times in this broadcast, it feels like, but the uh, other one, um, you know, I'm... Stuff like training troops just generally doesn't, doesn't necessarily get any better with uh, repeated reading, so I tend to skip those. Uh, let's see... Well, where is this county? I'm curious. There's something tempting about doing this simply because it would be for my wife, but it's really far away. I don't actually see... Like, the worst thing that can happen, I remember on my uh, Empire of Wales... I call it the Empire. It is the Empire of Britannia, but it did start in Wales. I remember through some bizarre series of accidents, I wound up with, like three provinces here and like two in Italy and every single time I went to war it was such a massive pain because there would usually be like let's say it was France or something like that they were closer they'd be able to actually invade those territories and it just hurt my war score so as cool as it would be to try and expand my realm uh, by capturing something for my wife and it'll certainly help the <laughs> it'll help the relationship a bit uh, I don't really want to go through all the trouble of obtaining it, and I definitely don't want to go through all the trouble of maintaining it. So instead we just... There's not a whole lot we can do. We can't put on any feasts or anything like that while we're at war. And I'll just hang out and wait for... Uh, wait for an opportunity. Ah, but I can build my castle town. I mean, the reasoning behind it is probably fairly self-explanatory. It, it is a big upfront cost, but I figure anything I can do to just keep that stream of income coming in, getting larger and larger, especially so early into the game. I mean, this game goes until like 1450 or something like that. It's uh, It just seems to me to be a bit of a no-brainer to, to put the initial investment in just to put yourself in a better position. Ultimately, I figure the higher monthly balance that you have, the more flexibility you have so far as training mercenaries. So maybe I wouldn't need to sit on 300 gold if I was making more money a month, just because I know that I would be able to get the resources I needed to uh, to support a war faster. Oh, that Mayor Gamel, always up to trouble. Okay, Mayor Gamel has arrested an armed man in ragged armor and a spotty horse. He says that the man claims to be a hedge knight, but he clearly does not believe that statement. I can order the hedge knight re released for five piety, or this is clearly a bandit, where the mayor will gain ten prestige, but I will lose five. And if there's one thing I hate losing in this game, it's prestige. So I am ordering the hedge knight released, and my marshal probably hates me now. Nope, no he doesn't. He's totally okay with this. I'm actually going to take a quick minute and see how my relationships with my bishops are going. Well, as kind of expected, they suck, but it looks like the Bishop of Furness is actually my best option here. But I already have my chaplain working on that, actually, so I will leave the realm as it is. I think what I will do, though, is I'll get rid of this fabricate, uh, fabricate a claim on Cumberland and instead just start working on Wales. Again, I can really do the Holy War at any point on Hereford, but I do need a cause of spelly for uh, Gwynedd, or however you pronounce it. And I don't necessarily want to engage in any of those wars until I have somebody that I can give the title to, but... I can at least get myself the claim and hope that somebody comes up to take advantage of it. My wife isn't too old. Well, yeah. Probably shouldn't hold my breath for more kids. 
could not help but overhearing the stable master and courtier's animated discussion. Something about a horse and payment due today, but the courtier insisted to pay the stable master later that week. I should interfere. Settle the matter between Aidfeld and my stable master. I tried to be as just as I could. And they still won't speak to each other. Now seems a good time to double check that I don't have anybody trying to kill me. Well, there is somebody trying to kill me, but doesn't have any backers. Actually, looks like Jorvik's doing a good job of giving my king a run for his money. I'm kind of curious what his forces look like. That's really interesting. So, I mean, if I was particularly foolhardy, one thing that I could try and do is assert my independence around this point. Now, I don't have enough troops to face him head on, but I do have enough money to raise mercenaries. Um, it's not something I want to do just because I have other avenues through which I can do that, and I can definitely make myself stronger within the kingdom before I consider asserting the independence. But I know we had some questions earlier in the previous broadcast about how I was able to get through the Vikings. Uh, and this is just one of the things is you wait for them to, you wait for your liege or you wait for somebody who has something that you want to, you know, basically get careless uh, or go into a particularly costly war. And, you know, at this, in this case too, I don't need to worry so much about the 3000 troops that England has. Because right now, 293 are fighting uh, Jorvik. I would have 2,000 troops to knock down these 1,800. And then the remaining force I could just go and meet on my own terms. Uh, so it's pretty reasonable to think I wouldn't actually need mercenaries to be able to claim independence. But of course, I, don't, I haven't looked at what kind of allies England either. Like to fight them, I would also need to be fighting... Nobody. Okay, well, yeah. It's still, I still don't think it's a good idea just because I get more from being in this kingdom than uh, than not. But it's always something that I keep on. It's always something that I keep in mind when I'm uh, sort of plotting my next next moves. And it looks like she got two two territories. And it actually looks like I'm going to be losing some options as far as expansion is concerned. So while I did originally want to wait till I had have some people in my bloodline that could get those territories, I'm actually going to declare war on Jorvik right now and claim that for myself. I'll do the similar thing in Wales as a, in a minute. This is a nice feature. So basically, uh, if your king declares war on the territory you do go to war with them but you are not held by the truce so i as a vassal can independently declare war on jorvik and i don't need to worry about breaking truces and actually looks like uh, cumberland must have voluntarily become a vassal of england i don't see why why that would suddenly become english all right, that's kind of annoying that they just walked out, but I'll just crush them and carry on with my siege. So again, my vassals are kind of annoyed about having to give up troops, even though they don't pay taxes for them. So in this case, I'm just going to ditch those. I don't feel too well. Something is wrong with me. I'm burning up with fever, my nose is running, and my head feels as if someone is banging something hard against it. Please kill me. I'm sort of breaking my rule of, uh, A five five speed um, run, but that's mostly because Jorvik is a fairly easy target to take down. Now I do face a bit of a decision here. There were some boats from Denmark that dropped off troops. There's uh, 797 of them, so nothing that I should be really too panicky about, but definitely a meaningful force. I could decide to abandon the siege of Jorvik and take them out now, or I can just kind of hope that they don't um, 
they don't get enough. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, and I'm actually going to see uh, what ships are showing up. If there's any other ships that show up, uh, I'm going to run and crush them. If, on the other hand, you know, they just sort of hang out, then I'm okay with that. I'll just, you know, I'll wait till the siege is over and then come and, and hit them. Um, but Denmark is, I believe, a fairly strong kingdom. The only thing that I need to worry about is the fact that... Or the only thing I need to... Like, I need to worry about their troop size, but I do have the advantage of the fact that they do actually need to carry them from a pretty far distance. If, on the other hand, of course, this force was large enough that they were able to lay siege to that holding, I'd pretty much abandon the siege of Jorvik and go and deal with them. So, It could be, like, this could be a strategy that doesn't serve me very well, and there is another ship coming in, but it looks like they're not... Oh, yep, yeah, they are going in, so... I'll just see the size of the force. Yeah, 808, I'm not too worried about. So I will finish the siege, siege of Jorvik. But if there's, like, a 17 size ship that's coming through here, uh, I drop this immediately and go deal with them. And again, it's just a matter of making sure that your enemies are uh, pretty far distance. They are, s and they're surrounded by other bloodthirsty Vikings. Yeah, exactly. So, as long as like, I guess the big thing too, even if you're fighting uh, France, like France can't do a whole lot to England unless you don't pay attention to your coasts, and all of a sudden you find that you've got like a force of five thousand people that you now need to deal with. Yeah. So. Doesn't look like there's any people on those boats. But this is, of course, why I usually go down to like a speed of three during a combat or something like that. It's just to make sure that I don't suddenly have, you know, a force twice the size of what I'm used to. It's also kind of nice that the Vikings aren't unified enough that they, um, you know, that they'll stop the raids. So there's a couple of raids that come by but they're not necessarily going to, um, you know, they're not necessarily going to do a whole lot to your realm um, just because they're focusing on somebody else's. So yeah, this, the Skeins, well, that's actually, a, it's a meaningful uh, raiding party, so... I kind of wish they were smaller, but I am going to just... This will deal my war, uh, deal with my war score, whereas killing the raiders is just going to make sure I don't lose gold. So there's always a priority to, uh, to knock these guys out first. Not entirely sure how uh, the Welsh feel about me fighting battles on their territories, but I'll be their king soon enough. And they are going to Glen Morgan. The fever is gone, my nose is dry, the headache is long gone, and I feel alive once again. Alright, and I get to go punch some more Vikings up in Jorvik. I haven't quite... One strategy I've always imagined would be effective, but I haven't actually been able to make work, is to actually give a small breather between sieges so they can actually bring troops up. Oop, I've decided to institute medium crown authority law in the Kingdom of England. Your status as my de jure vassal entitles you to a vote on the matter. I don't like high crown authority unless I'm the king. So the one thing I was thinking of is like giving them enough time to actually raise troops like they just did there, uh, because it's obviously easier to overwhelm a small force with your own uh, than it is to just kind of grind through a siege. But I've never actually found it to be that meaningful towards the war score. I think it's just because the number of troops that come up is so small. But uh, it's always felt like something that should work a little bit better. Okay captured more people, and my experience in matters of war has increased to the point where the many things you will do differently in future battles. What will I focus on? Winter terrain, flat terrain, cavalry, or light foot? I think the answer to that should actually be... What's my... I mean, this isn't a really good indication of the composition of the army because it's already been through a few battles and has suffered casualties, but what do I have the most of? I don't really like winter and flat terrain just because that's a very situational advantage, whereas cavalry and light foot are... 
Um, ugh, this is a tough call. I think I'll go for the light foot. But yeah, I don't necessarily like the, t the territorial ones just because you don't... Well, if you plan better than I do, you don't necessarily know where you'll be fighting. Um, whereas a particular unit type, you can you can have a little more direct control over. It's a bit of intrigue going on that I don't care so much about. The intrigue I care about is the plot on my life. And I am going to just do a little bit of ransoming. Because it's always nice to pay for your wars with other people's gold. To the Anglo-Saxon bigot Eidbald, tales of your misdeeds are told from Ireland to Cathay. I accept paying your ransom for the safe return of Bjorg. To the narrow-minded infidel Eidbald, may your years be short and miserable. I accept paying your ransom for the safe return of Godi. In this case, he's paying for himself, but... I do particularly like the insults in this game. It's maybe not quite to the Shakespearean level, but it's damn close sometimes. I think my favorite is your low character is the type of written about in Greek plays or something like that. Okay, lost a perfectly good spy master. Oh god, do I really have to put my wife back in the job? <laughs> Alright. Yeah, they drop in the smack talk in this game. It's fine, I have their provinces. They can talk all they want. <laughs> Why are they gonna get the <laughs> And I don't believe I've said hi to you yet, Trek. Thanks for stopping by. Honestly, I wish my wife would just have a kid. It's all I need. Don't need a spy master. Especially one that wants to kill me every other, you know, every other day. I just want a kid. <laughs> uh, the thunder forgive me. I've decided to find salvation. Oh no! I've decided to find salvation in the Lord and convert to the Catholic faith. I hope we can put this unpleasant unpleasantness behind us forthwith. Cuckled my wife and then legitimized my bastard child. That would be nice. Uh, I don't believe I can voluntarily do that, though. Uh, I don't have the way of life expansion where I believe you can seduce people. So. Probably a wise move. So I gained 100 piety, but what I really wanted was the territory here. So uh, I hate it when they convert. I think the one time I did actually legitimize a bastard... Oh, here we go. Speaking of her, her need to support the House of Rose, I think the one time I did legitimize a bastard, he wound up killing my heir. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, this, this was such a great story, actually. I remember exactly what happened now. So not only did I sire a bastard, it was actually with my son's wife. I think my... The king who did that was, like, 59, and, like, the wife was 19 or something like that. I um, legitimized the bastard. The bastard then killed the son whose wife I had slept with and he inherited the kingdom. 10 out of 10. Would Crusader King again? It's good to be the king. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you can't write stuff that good for a game like this. I, it is probably the thing I like the most is how the mechanics of the game will allow for some absolutely absurd stories like that to come up. Let's see if I can build any more castle towns. 
Well, I can build them for vassals, but how about... I think what I'm going to do, just because vassals can eventually turn against me, I think I'm just going to focus on my own territories for now. So I'll do a training grounds when I've got about 600 gold. <laughs> uh. I definitely like reading chat after a couple of people have come in because Crusader Kings 2 leads to the best quotes. I've decided to institute medium crowd authority law in the Kingdom of England. Your status as made du jour vassal entitles you to vote on the matter. Well, I'll give you the same answer I gave your father. A courtier has come forth inviting all knights of the realm to attend a grand tournament, the like of which has only been seen once per reign. Oh, right, okay. So that's cool. The king finally decided to do these things. Chance to prove our worth or a foolish risk for fleeting glory? Well, obviously I want the 50 prestige. I'm also feeling particularly warlike, so I've got enough troops. I think I'm just going to go for Hereford after the tournament, though. Looks like there's trouble going on in the south of England, but I'm not that worried because it's not close to me and they're all my rivals. I'm just also kind of curious about what some of my other options here are. I mean, lower crown authority would be good, but I'm not entirely sure what happens to you if you're in a faction that draws the king's attention, and I don't particularly want to start any kind of revolution yet. It'd be nice to have lower crown authority, but I haven't suffered too greatly under it, so I'm just going to stick to my knitting and uh, focus more on... Ah, excellent. So that came right around the time that I needed it. Uh, the tournament ends, although I may not have won any of the melee events, my prowess did not go unnoticed. But of course, 50 prestige. So, for some reason, I lose Lancaster when I die. Oh, this is because the king probably changed the Succession laws. Oh, okay, here's the trick. So I'm back to gavel kind because I've been blocking the king uh, from instituting high crown authority law. That sucks. So maybe I don't actually want a son anymore. I think I'm just going to have to accept it, and then I'll worry about maybe... I think I'll just send the assassins. This is probably the way to handle that. I think I'll actually assassinate the son after I have, after this guy has passed away, because I don't want something to happen to my only heir and wind up losing more. Don't suppose I get to change my vote on crown authority? Nope. Well, I started playing Crusader Kings 2 after the assassinate button had been removed, so I don't, uh, I'm lucky enough that I don't, uh, have to miss it. I guess I, sw I said I was gonna declare war on Hereford. Oh, what? Did he convert? No, so why can't I declare war? Oh, he's not in event. I just need to click the right guy. Uh, for Powis? Ah, so just the one county. Imagine throwing away a fortune for a 30% chance to kill some... Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> I 
I will definitely say that assassination does not seem to be the most effective tool. Oops. Let's, I think I can save this. Should have been a little more careful in terms of how I raised my troops. Okay. Well, I didn't lose that much, but... Just kind of... It's a shame. Like, I really hate when I make mistakes like that just because it's an unnecessarily loss. And they might have been my personal levy. I take it by Bison Moon Boo, you're referring to the Empire of Byzantium? So one of the reasons I was a little less uh, scared, let's say, to... I actually keep noticing that I lose a lot of my vassal levies, so what... Yeah, so I need to stop doing that in enemy territory. I also need to make sure that I'm actually hitting the limit, so let's just divide this in a slightly more intelligent way. Still a little too big, but I think I'll just have to live with it. I don't think there's any better division I can do for this. Let's just double check. Well, okay, I can take out Chester. That shouldn't cause too much problem. Oh, yes it does, because then I don't have enough troops to siege. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, fine. I'll just... <laughs> I'll take the opinion modifier then. So that's really weird. Th apparently what this means then is that there is the supply limit for troops exceeds the actual number of defenders in the base. Oh, what expansions do I have? Games not worth playing without Sword of Islam, Old God, Sons of Abraham, and Legacy of Rome. I have all of those expansions. The only two that I don't have are... Charlemagne and the Way of Life. I actually have a feeling I'm probably going to lose my siege. Uh, yeah, you know, there's actually no way for me to be able to take this then. Because I keep losing, I keep losing the siege units before. Um, oh well. Really, you feel it's actually kind of interesting because a lot of people come by here and ask whether or not I'm playing the Way of Life expansion, um, and I thought the Chronicle feature would actually be kind of interesting in Charlemagne. So you're the first person I've actually heard who didn't have a very high opinion of uh, Way of Life. Or, well, I mean, that is kind of implied. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to make sure I get those uh, expansions when they're on sale. And Freighter 5, are those, are you referring to Charlemagne and Way of Life, or are you referring to the other, like, the um, expansions that uh, Shrek just referred to? Alright, thanks a lot for stopping by, I smell like poo. Uh, Charlemagne and Way of Life. Uh, Way of Life is good, don't get me wrong, I just think it explodes the, the few, few XX events. <laughs> I 
Uh, I could hire mercenaries, but aren't they just going to wind up dying to the supply? Um, like, aren't they just going to wind up dying to the supply um, limit? Uh, if you want to play as Charlemagne, cool, but you're paying fifteen dollars for you're just paying fifteen dollars just for Charlemagne events, and that sucks. Okay. I mean, I think there's a bit of an appeal to an earlier start date, which one of the, was one of the reasons why I liked the old gods. But I, I will agree that I think just spending fifteen dollars for a set of events seems a little expensive. Well, yeah, but they're mercenaries. Yeah. So honestly, I don't necessarily mind spending the money on mercenaries if it will get me that territory. But my concern is just spending a bunch of money on mercenaries that wind up um, dying before they can finish the job. If I buy cheap mercs. Well, yeah, again, it's the. I've got 620 gold, so that's not really my concern. I guess the, the thing that I'm worried about here is if there's a $2,000 supply limit, uh, are 1,500 mercenaries or 3,000 mercenaries going to live long enough to be able to finish the siege uh, before they fall below 2,000? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I guess the big... So, okay, we'll give this a try, but I'll, I think... Well, actually, one of two things will work. Either I'll be able to demonstrate the point, or um, it'll work and I can just shut up. So, what do I want to buy? I think I'll go for the $300 ones, which kind of sucks because I was going to build something with that, but let's not go cheap. Um, are there any $300 ones left? Okay, nope, so I'll do... Oh, yeah, there's these. Um, yeah, these seem, seem fine. Yeah, I know dead mercenaries don't, um, don't have upkeep costs. They're particularly good units to rush into into enemy soldiers. Okay, still not big enough. Well, I won't do a mega death stack just because I don't want, like, I want the mercenaries to die, not my uh, my troops. But I will commit a few more of mine into that. And it will definitely be vassal levies that are going in there. like 3.8 a month. I always thought it scaled depending on how large your um, your force was. It should be telling us though. Apparently not. Oh, there we go. 3.5% uh, Okay, yeah, so I can make a huge death stack. Alright. Let's go decimate my army. I hope this works. <laughs> the crazy attrition is a desert like 10%. Yeah, I haven't played any um, 
any caliphates, but <laughs> I did go on one crusade. And I think I was a small enough player I didn't need to worry so much about attrition, but I have a suspicion that most of the Crusades ended in failure for a reason. To the Just Pilgrim Eidbald, may you would you li I would like to appoint you as my spy master. What do you say? I say yes. I'm actually really curious what my stats are. Okay, I'm an okay spy master. That was his original ambition, actually, and then I switched it to having a daughter, which never actually happened. Okay, so this time I am actually going to approve medium crown law. There's no chance that I'll have primogeniture in time, but at least it puts us on track. Oh my god, we didn't actually have enough. Uh, and I can't raise anything else. Can't hire anything else. Um, hmm. Well, this is a problem. Yeah, it's back to full force. So, I'm thinking I need to declare white peace, take the hit to my prestige, and come up with a better plan for next time. Because I'm bankrupting myself and there's no way I'm going to be able to take that territory. Now, I could be the bigger man and not say I told you so. <laughs> no, I'm actually going to take my break. And my wife still wants to <laughs> still wants to kill me. All right, so I'm about half an hour late for my uh about half an hour late for my break. Um, that's, I mean, it's a little disappointing how that um, siege turned out. We did have 600 gold at the start, but uh, it's nothing that we can't recover from. But uh, at this point here, I uh, am going to just take a minute to get up, stretch, refill my water. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Oh, you can be the bigger man and shut it because you should have sieged with the mercs. I did siege with the mercs, and then I believe somebody was talking about a death ball. But anyways, doesn't matter. Um, I am going... Then you shouldn't have to pay all that upkeep. I, we did talk about this, but that's fine, because it's, it's over, and uh, I'll just make a... Basically just make a better, uh, a better assault next time around. So I'm just going to get up, stretch, get a glass of water. I encourage you guys to do the same. I'll be no more than three minutes, and then we can come back and continue a conquest of Wales which doesn't involve the Viking holdings. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you guys in a couple minutes.
You know, I always say uh, I'm going to be about three minutes, but I never actually look at the time when I announce the break. So, yeah, I thought I thought so. I turned the volume up. So, I think I just need to. Well, I mean, what I need to do is I need to either. Um, just mute it directly in OBS or get a mute uh, mute button on the the program. But yeah, the, the like the streaming setup that I have right now is basically on a kitchen table. I'm in a studio style apartment. So like there's no individual, it's like all one big room. Uh, so the bathroom is almost literally behind me. And so I'm absolutely astonished that you don't hear me like filling a glass of water and stuff like that during the stream all the time. But Oh, hey, Maticus Ray. How's it going? Yeah. Well, it was number one this time, not number two. But yeah, it's just, I figure at the very least I can keep the domestic sounds uh, to a minimum on the on the stream. I figure it's kind of like having a video camera up and... Uh, it's kind of like having a video camera up and um, like having dirty laundry in the background. Like nobody, I think, technically cares, but there's just a certain level of professionalism that you want to have during this. So, And looks like we... I'm not sure if Shrek's still here or not. I wasn't sure if he was being serious uh, or not. It's hard to tell sarcasm on, on that, but I mean, that's fine. I, if he was serious, I'm not entirely sure that's the kind of dialogue that I want to have in there. Lived in the studio apartment this summer, which you really liked. It's simpler. Yeah, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time in it because of, uh, because of school, but the only thing is that I have a lot of books, so there tends to be like a because I've got how many, like five bookshelves, um, plus a couple of other things that I use to store books, um, it sort of limits my options as far as where I put other things. But I can play games, I can sleep, I can read, which are kind of the three things that I need to do. What am I in school for? I am an economics student. I'm actually just finishing up my undergrad and I spent a ridiculous amount of money applying to grad schools. Don't eat on mic and it's all good. Yeah, actually, you know, that's funny. There's a lot of people who um, who really call out a lot of streamers that I, I like on um, on eating on mic. I mean, I think because this is pretty much audio only and just a little bit of uh, uh, monetarist, Keynesian, Austrian. Uh, oh, hey, it's like you're me, but econ... Uh, rather than poli sci. Well, it's funny you should mention, actually, because I'm really interested in the topic of political economy, uh, which tends to take a lot of either insights or ideas from uh, political science and just takes advantage of some of the econometric tools to study them. So I'm interested in poli, uh, poli sci, but I haven't actually taken a course on it. Uh, and to answer your question, Maticus Ray, I don't have a direct opinion on uh, monetarist Keynesian or Austrian. I'm not familiar. Is public choice theory isn't the Kenneth Arrow uh, idea, is it? Um, but yeah, to answer your uh, question, Maticus Ray, I've studied um, both Keynesian, uh, specifically New Keynesian, so something that's tried to be uh, micro founded. Um, the first thing that we learned in the honors uh, macroeconomics class was real business cycle theory, which is probably a little bit closer to the um, the monetarist or Austrian uh, economics that you... Like, it's it's not exactly a match, but it tends to be a little bit more... Um, it's a little simpler, and it's something that talks a bit more about how the market works on its own. Um, I think the best summary... Not sure Buchanan was a big name in it. I'll have to look it up. Um, I'm, I'm not always good with like what I tend to notice is there's a lot of things that I've learned in my classes which are, um, like the, their ideas that. So people will mention an idea, and I don't know it by the name that people commonly say, but it's an idea I've actually encountered in the class. So I'll look up public choice theory when I uh, when I have an idle second. But yeah, I think the best thing I can say about dividing those uh, those different viewpoints um, would be. 
And I'll, I'll adapt something that my professor told me when we were studying it was that, you know, it's not like the real business cycle people when they were developing their models didn't actually like, it's not like they were making things up. They were seeing the world as it actually was. Um, and then there was something that people couldn't resolve. And then that turned into new Keynesianism. It sort of adapted some of the things that had, you know, some of the things that were good about uh, Keynesian view, but let's say refine them into, let's say, a more modern perspective. Uh, now, neither real business cycle theory or, uh, you know, new Keynesianism. And I know some people are trying to do uh, new monetarism as well. I think Stephen Williamson is a, an author and a blogger who does a lot on that. And he's written the textbook. Actually, I have his textbook here. It's probably about a intermediate, so I'd say maybe advanced undergraduate level. And he does a, he does a treatment of a few different schools, but it's um, he's definitely... Like, he's pretty harsh to New Keynesianism, and I think in some unfair ways. Uh, someone should write a book on Crusader Kings 2 and how it relates to public choice theory. Uh, public choice theory is about self-interest and how it applies to political situations. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely... It's one of the reasons why I like uh, Crusader Kings 2, but... Sorry, I'm kind of talking... I'm I'm not finishing a single thought, but yeah, so the, uh, on the point of the different models that you can use to look at the economy, the whole point is that they are simplifications of you know, a very complex system to try and explain how it works. So any of those views are useful to us insofar as they explain the world that's going on, and I don't necessarily think that they should become dogmas for people. So, um, you know, there are a couple of things that have fairly unambiguous results, which kind of surprised me a bit. So there's been some talk about, you know, people have been studying um, ways to engage in a fiscal consolidation, and generally they say that cutting spending uh, will cause a soft landing or will, will bring prosperity um, to a country uh, when they want to do a fiscal consolidation, whereas raising taxes tends to cause uh, great hardship and it lasts for a while. And I mean, this is a few different sources that have said that, but probably the most interesting one was David Romer, who has advised uh, President Obama. And I mean, obviously... If he's an advisor to the Democrats, you know, the Democrats certainly know that that is a viewpoint that's quite different from uh, what they want. But it seems like that is his conclusion. I think it's also his wife, Christina Romer. They co-authored a paper on it. Now, I don't know which side is true, um, but I think it's a good example of how somebody who doesn't necessarily have a particular agenda uh, can look at an issue. They will use a particular model. And they will try to come up with as honest of an estimation in terms of how, you know, how to recommend a, a particular policy choice. Um, but yeah, I mean, self-interest and how it affects political situations, uh, that can be something that falls a little bit under political economy. But there's a, there's a few different things that go... There's a few different things that sort of fall under that um, category. It's, uh, it's a fairly... I want to say, say it's a new one because like some of the old classic... Uh, economists like Alfred Marshall, um, their books were called Political Economy. But it sort of seems to be that um, it's turned into something a little bit different, and it's a pretty exciting area of research uh, that some fairly new economists are doing some interesting work on. Uh, my liege, I've collected a tithe in Westmoreland. The money should reach you together with this letter. I mean, I actually, maybe to this point as well, I should say, um, oh, <laughs> looks like we've got some trouble going on to the narrow-minded glutton Edvald, may your humors rot in your living body. This is a formal declaration of war. Our armies shall meet on the field of battle. So who is this? Duke of Northumbria. Oh, wow. All right. I should be able to get through this. Just gonna slow it down a little bit. I have a bigger force with higher morale, so as long as I can consolidate quickly enough, I should be able to get through this. Yeah, we're about evenly matched uh, as far as. N oh, never mind. I actually outnumber him by quite a bit. This is usually why I keep the money aside for mercenaries. It's a little too... 
I think if I try and buy mercenaries now, I'm going to put myself in a really bad spot. So I think I'll just wait till my morale is up to its peak, and hopefully he loses a few, a few troops. Does cause his belly? Uh, I have no idea, actually. They, um, they didn't say that uh, somebody had fabricated a, a title, but he must have. I'm assuming the game doesn't cheat. All right, hold on to your hats, folks. Let's see how this goes. Nope, no, I want to see the fireworks. Oh, wow, it looks like there's a few people who want my blood. This is going to go really badly for me in a second. I might want to just hire mercenaries to delay this group from coming in. No, no, we're good. So we'll just cut them in half and then mop up the remainder. Oh, let's take a look. Northumbrian claim on Lancaster? Sorry, where should I be looking for the cause? Yeah, okay, fair enough. So this is a concern. Um, I think just for safety, I mean, it's a bit of a risk because I'll only have 50 gold left over, but I think getting some mercenaries should just tilt this to my favor. Although there's somewhat low morale, so I kind of got to be careful about this. Yeah, we're boned. Oh, this is ugly. Okay. Um, what do I do about this? Well, we run away first. I think at this point I should just surrender and cut the bleeding. If only Shrek was here to give me advice, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I didn't check to see if I had any allies I could call in. I think it's a little late for that, but let's see what we can do. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, I just kind of got to run no matter when. Uh, yeah, he's not joining my war. So I think, um, as much as I hate to do this, I just surrender. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. It's better to dismiss than lose. I, I already uh, surrendered, though, so... That just sucks, because Lancaster was my big holding. That's two pretty big wars that we actually wound up losing. I think if I... what I probably should have done... Uh, was been a little hastier on the mercenaries just to make sure that I would have an overwhelming force and actually just delay the conflict even further. But...
I do have the du jour claim, so basically I can... I can actually go to war whenever I want. I'll just wait till I rebuild. I'm particularly concerned about the treasury, and we should be able to get that back. So. I think what this means, though, it's... I think what's probably going to happen for the next generation, I think um, I'll probably end the playthrough uh, when this guy dies. I think what the next generation is going to wind up doing is just, it's mostly going to be about reconsolidating rather than, actually, I probably shouldn't have this uh, Chancellor working on. Well, I can always just cancel the Causes Belly um, and gain the piety for it. So I think what's basically going to happen with this guy's son who probably isn't married, actually. Let me... Oh, he is married. Good. Does he have kids yet? Nope. So what I'm thinking is uh, the first couple of years are basically going to be assassinating his brother and inheriting the um, the territories. Uh, and then the main focus should be on retaking Lancaster. My hope is that uh, Hereford goes sort of isn't taken by England because I still want to work on taking Wales but I think I need to maybe tend to my own house a little bit and I think more importantly I need to I think my biggest mistake here was just trying to do the mercenary strategy in Hereford like it's not bad to experiment with stuff like that but it left my treasury too empty so that when crisis came where I've always tried to have an amount of gold of 300 is the one time I didn't have it. And it was the one time that I, I wound up really needing it. So it's, uh, it's a good learning experience, I guess. All right. An emissary for, from Pope Boniface the sixth has arrived in your court. Uh, according to the emissary, the Holy Father is concerned about your employment as a heathens as advisors. The Pope is asking me to remove them from the position. I think that's my marshal. Yeah. So what is he contributing? 12. Yikes. I really don't like losing 50 piety, but it's definitely got the skills that I need. So what I will do instead is proselytize. Just wish I knew where he was. But actually, your earlier point, um, Maticus, I didn't even, I had never really thought of that before, which was that if you're about to lose a fight, it's not necessarily, like, you don't necessarily just have to sit there and take it. You can always just make them vanish. Um, and that would have allowed me to string out the conflict a little bit longer and maybe hopefully uh, split the armies up. So I'll remember that for next time. Okay, good. So we've got our... We've got all good guys on our side now, so what do we do with... Oh, okay, I can't change him back until November. Covering the flag over there is... Yeah, I know how to check for the um I know how to check for the date, but I think the thing that I never appreciated was I'd use it for like planning my escape route, but I'd never really thought about what to do when they're going to get there on time. Um So, what I've usually just wound up doing is sort of playing Benny Hill, you know, as I run across the English countryside. And you know, sometimes I could say it's like, okay, well, 
I'll move to the next territory because I could get there in time, or if I couldn't get there in time, I'd just stay there and accept my fate. But clearly, removing your troops from the area uh, through dismissing them is preferable to just letting them get their asses kicked by the enemy. So it's a really simple thing to do. I don't know why I'd never thought of it before, but it's definitely really helpful. <laughs> what a merry feast, surrounded by my friends and loved ones. I feel a thirst coming on. Page, more wine. Wait, this doesn't smell right. And... <laughs> I could feel death breathing down my, ne my neck. Who would want me dead? I'm pretty sure I know. <laughs> oh, cool, I survived. Wife? Stop. I was for sure. I, I was certain I was dead there. I mean, I should have just sent assassins, but I really didn't want to get the Kinslayer uh, modifier. This is such a promising rule from this guy. Time for divorce or murder. <laughs> Well, I mean, the plan was just when I... Nope. Oh, yep. More of that terrible decision to expel the jury. Actually, you know what? Maybe you guys can answer this for me because you've helped me with a couple of mechanical things. Um, one of the previous generations, I had expelled the jury. Now, I was independent at the time that that happened. And I noticed that I've never had the option to re-invite them. Now, is that because I am a vassal to the King of England now? Or is that because I... Um... Or is that just because, for some reason, I'm not allowed to bring them back after a couple of generations? Uh, yep, I'm revoking. It's basically just to get my holdings back up so I can have a big army. You probably have to be sovereign. Yeah, okay, cool. So the strategy should definitely be to focus on getting, um, getting whales then. Because it's definitely, like, that's something that's costing me quite a bit, is uh, not being able to have, uh, not being able to have my, um, uh, not being, like, basically not being able to put the research in uh, for, uh, not being able to put in the research for these upgrades because I know that I'm going to lose 50 to a random event every little while, so. I definitely wouldn't have done that if I'd known... Uh, I couldn't reverse the decision for becoming a vassal. So I think I'm going to wait on the magic three. This is basically going to be another holding pattern here where I'm going to wait till I hit 300 again. Uh, I'm going to hire a mercenary army and then I'm basically going to go straight for Lancaster again. It does mean that I'm going to have to consolidate a lot um, from my brother. Oop. Another kid. Oh, I wanted to check his stats. Well, that's fine. This is not going to be the guy I wind up playing, so. Um, but I'm thinking, actually, I want to... I definitely don't want to lose the claim if that's what happens. And he's fairly strong, so I... Uh, 1,500 mercenaries should be enough to deal with Northumbria. Oh, yeah, well, they only have 1,500 right now. Uh, and if I can take Lancaster before this guy dies, I should be happy. And I'll actually ransom him, seeing as I just took his territory. <laughs> actually, this would be a pretty good time if I had the money for it, just because I think his... Well, I'm going to be down for my levies, too. Uh, though I thought Earl Thorod to be a more reasonable man, his request allowed uh, to be allowed to duel his rival was slightly erratic. Earl Thorod claimed to be con uh, to be constantly subject to the fronts from his rival, and asked for permission to defend his honor. Uh, I can allow the duel, disallow it, but take no further action. Disallow it and banish the instigator. Oh, I'll just allow it.
Ah, excellent. It's a daughter, so I don't need to worry about succession problems. This has basically been a lifetime ambition to have a daughter. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do military. I don't think there's going to be much that I get out of this, but it'll at least help me out when I try to retake some of those territories. I actually just want to see if this guy has any meaningful allies. Uh, Duke of Wessex does have a pretty sizable army, so I definitely want to make sure I have the mercenaries when I try to take Lancaster back. But at least I have the piety. I may have fewer territories than I started off with, but... I'll admit, actually, this guy has lived longer than I thought he was going to. I didn't think that this was going to be a two-hour stream, but... That's fine. I'll... If it looks like I'm going to be eating too far into my homework... Sorry, I kind of... It sounded like you guys had a couple things to say about economics, which kind of just wound up being dropped due to events in the game. Um, but if I think it's going to eat into homework time too much, I'll I'll call it early. But I think I can get through the, the rest of this this generation. <laughs> Why won't you die? Yeah, I don't. Um, well, I mean, again, it'd be cool to reunite um, the the duchy before.